Welcome, everybody. Hi. Hello. I'm Mark Dibby Nation, uh, Chief of the Division here, and welcome to another Thursday at 3. I was going to wait 10 minutes uh, because Michael was pacing, but it just seemed cruel. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to start on time, just to spare him that. Um, we're amongst friends here, but in case you don't know, uh, Michael Platt and Carol Bean, do, I, do, we, do we need the middle initials? Michael B. Platt and Carol A. Bean um, have been collaborating on um, visual imagery and artist book creations uh, for a good 18 years now, since uh, their first volume came into the Library of Congress in 2001. Um, so we're in for, uh, and, and Carol in particular is a familiar face at these lectures and is known to many of us here in, in Washington as they're both of them. So we're really pleased to have them here together and it's going to be one of those moments. Um, M uh, Michael creates, uh, he's a printmaker, but he now prefers to be called an image maker, is that correct? Yes. Yes, because he makes images rather than prints. And um, this can range from, as I'm sure you will hear, from small portfolios to large walls in um, uh, school buildings recently, yes? Um, so from, from print to mural, um, uh, Carol is a poet, has been inspired by the African diaspora, but also um, um, some other experiences that have led her to create, in some cases, poetry that plays on call and response. Uh, and together, uh, the poetry and the images are combined into a single experience, uh, which is quite moving. You've had a chance to see some of them. Uh, you're welcome to come take a look at them as well after they're through speaking, but it's a real pleasure to have both of them here. Would you please welcome them? I'd really like to thank y'all for coming out. Um, I feel like I'm playing the big house. This is like the <laughs> how it did in the 50s. So, you know, this, this is really great. Um, I would like to really thank my wife who had the nerve to bring the first book we did up here. I thought she was out of her mind. <laughs> you know, she uh, barely made an appointment. She came up, and she came back home with this big ass grin on her face. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to know what happened, you know, but it was, it was good. It was really good. And uh, from there, we just kept making books. Uh, the first book we made was a, I guess it was a fulfilling a promise she made to her father who had passed away. Uh, she was supposed to, what were you writing on? Slavery in Latin America, yeah, uh, image of and literary correspondence. But that didn't happen. I mean, she, he, uh, he passed away. So I said, Carol, we're going to make a book and dedicate it to your father. So we're going to make a book on my images and her poems. And um, since I always had a little side projects of making things, uh, I think that's what artists do. They like to make things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I decided to make a little book. And then uh, we put it together and uh, we got lucky in this, in this collection here. Yeah. I think one of the things too that uh, inspired me as well as uh, Michael is Pyramid Atlantic, whom I think most of you in the DC area are familiar with. Michael used to go out there and print and uh, he was invited when they got the really huge printer to make the inaugural print on that. But you can't, you couldn't be, you can't and couldn't be at Pyramid Atlantic without people all around you doing books and making paper and, and uh, everything was just wonderful. And I would go home and I would think, that looks like something that's really interesting and, and fun. So the, the object um, was, it has always been very important. And then uh, my brother and I grew up in a household with, with parents who were New Yorkers. And uh, we always had a library, like a separate room that was the library. Uh, so if you're a New Yorker from the city, you know, they're from Harlem, then you go to the New York Public Library, and you're in Harlem, you go to the Schomburg Center. Uh, and in fact, we worked on that during WPA days way back when. So there was all that, and then he came to Howard as a student, so he actually worked at the Library of Congress. That was one of his jobs back in the late 30s, early 40s. So it's wonderful to be here, so I thank Mark. And I thank John Cole, who is the director of the Center of the Book. I don't know if he still is. I hope so. <coughs> who said, well, you need to go over and talk to Mark Dimination. And then the familiar faces and people who have gotten to know, and uh, Christina Wasserman, because someone said, you really should go and talk to the people at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, because they have a tremendous artist book collection. So it's been uh, an experience of you know, increased uh, friendships and growth and 
for finding out about new materials and new technology. So we had been married about 10 years when uh, Michael decided that we should do this first book. <coughs> because I, as an academic, my academic writing always came with great difficulty. Um, but I always wrote poetry from when I was little. And the thing is, I never showed it to very many people, in fact, hardly anybody. So this is the first book, um, Forgotten Contours, which you've seen on the table there, and which um, Mark and the collection has. And the, pure, the paper is handmade paper from Pyramid Atlantic that we kind of, I finally fell in love with. And everything else was done on our kitchen table. So our, our whole house is basically studio. <laughs> um, and the, p the poem, this is a, a favorite of mine at the time, in two th late, mm, not late 1990s and, and 2000s, um, I had been going through a lot of losses. Um, my son, that was back in 95, and then other close friends. And um, so a lot of the poem, poetry that I was writing at that time was uh, poetry about loss and about pain, um, both personally and then thinking about it and, and, and talking with uh, you know, friends who are doing research projects on, for example, slavery, uh, displacement, migration. These are also personal things that touch us very deeply, but they're also reflected in the world around us. And this is one of those, the first poems. Sorrow cuts so finely that at first we do not feel its edge. We wait for the joy after sadness. It is long in coming, and we fear that we will have forgotten its contours. This, this is the end piece of that, of that first book. Michael in the late 90s had done a series of wonderful charcoal drawings that I loved based on a a book of South African photographs of the Bushmen of South Africa. And he began to do these drawings and uh, I think making the, with, with the goal of making the photograph more of a personal statement. And I think you can see that in this one. So this was one of the ones of that series that he did. They were quite large. And uh, it, it's the poem, which I call Mother's Stories, mm -hmm. because uh, my father died in 98 and my mother came to live with us in DC. And she had some dementia, probably not Alzheimer's, but at any rate, every day was a new day and every hour was a new hour and every minute was a new minute. Literally. And so <laughs> she, she would come downstairs in the morning and she was basically our proofreader because she would look at, and this one was f a favorite poem of hers. She didn't make the connection. So this one is, mother's stories are long in telling, are sometimes filled with silent echoes of resonances beyond their daughter's knowing. So we wait and listen carefully to fragments and nuances and hope to be around when they get in the friend, in, with their friends in the kitchen and begin with the, remember whens? And the, well, did I ever tell you and the, oh, you should have seen. Now we have come more fully to understand how and why they still call each other girl, or as some say, share. But this is more infrequent than we'd like. And sooner, rather than later, it is violated by illness and failings and forgettings and the falling away of friends till there are few with whom to sit and talk. My mother would come downstairs and she would say, I think I'd really like your poem. So one day Michael said, Oris, that poem's about you, don't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> and she just kind of looked. Sometimes when she would come down, I gave her the nickname of Eagle Eyes. She was a <laughs> third grade teacher in New York. And she would find a mistake. When I think I'm ready for production, you know, and so sometimes after I printed the first one, and I thought she'll find it. So I used to call her Eagle Eyes. <laughs> but this was a, a really 
this book is, is probably one of my favorite ones when I think about the whole process. Uh, the, the first one, you know, it's like always trying to get back to that first high. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, solitary moment. Uh, this was um, usually I would do a set of drawings, uh, and the drawings I would work on, or paintings, or images, or prints I work from, usually came from the preceding one. So a lot of times it's not with a specific subject matter in mind. I just you work your way into a a theme. You know, solitary moments, uh, solitary. Uh, mornings. Um, most of these images are 40 by 60. They, they're, they're large. And uh, it's been my experiences when you draw and you paint and you um, print, coming up with that right size that people, so they won't be all in the basement, you know. So, uh, but I, I hung on to this 40 by 60, which is, you know, that, about that size, the size I am. I got that from um, a teacher up at Howard, uh, one of my favorite teachers, Ed Love, who passed away. And this is uh, from a combination of a, a courtyard in, uh, was it, in, in uh, Africa, in, um, a court in Ghana, in one of the slave castles, I call them slave castles. And I like the textures uh, in the head. Uh, you, you, in other words, I keep working on these things so they feel like my drawings or my, my paintings. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is horrible. Uh, uh, I'm going to let that sit there. I, I can't find it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, just like a lot of the other images, I keep putting, in, putting things together, overlapping images, overlapping textures, overlapping figures, overlapping spaces. Till um, you find magic, and uh, when that magic hits you, uh, sometimes it takes a lot of nerve to stop and not overdevelop the magic. So that's, that's another thing I got into. Uh, just I don't care if it doesn't feel finished. Just stop, because that's when <laughs> I, I feel the magic. But sometimes you cheat and you you, over, you you work on it a little bit more. But that usually happens around four o'clock in the morning, because uh, I work I work at night, and. Uh, Put out the champagne, you know, last one today. <laughs> Don't win every day, you, but you do win every now and then. You know, uh, like most artists will tell you, no matter what we say, uh, we got a lot of stuff in the basement that didn't work. <laughs> most of the stuff we do does not work. I don't care what they say. Uh, it's, it's true. But all you got to do, wait till somebody dies. Go in the basement and see all that stuff that didn't, didn't give it up. I just wanted to say, too, that the first book that we showed you, um, I had a body of work that was done already and Michael had the images that he had worked. So in that case, it was a matter of seeing what went with what. Um, and sometime, for the most part, we were, I think, lucky. The second, the second book was some of that, but more writing to the pieces. But we definitely knew that we didn't want to illustrate them. We just wanted a feel back and forth. Uh, this image, um, the model, as it turned out, was uh, I think her father was Nigerian, but she just had a tremendous presence about her. And she, there's another image of her in the uh, portfolio that you can see on the side if you didn't already. And this is a poem that goes with that. I'd just like to read that as well. This refers to the, our experience of having visited the slave castles or the slave factories, as they're known in uh, Elmina in Ghana. Long after you were long gone from the fetid dampness where accumulations of excrement and other human waste remained, monuments of the minutiae of survival, where the excavator's chalk had measured and marked the wall. The corner farthest from the door was its highest point. There where dark flowers stained and bloomed on domed dungeon ceilings and walls bloomed with stained blossoms in the darkness of high noon and blossomed at dusk with pale bloom satining the darkness dimly and staining the midnight hours of lightless days with dark blossoms. There, where the people had been, where spent heavy air had moved slowly, overcome with sadness, anguished at its own insufficiency, 
there within those walls where the women had waited and the men had waited and the children who arrived, who oft times never left, had waited. We stood and listened to the weight of waiting. This again is from the second book, Solitary Morning. And it came actually from thinking about the stories, memory talking with older relatives, listening to other people's conversations, eavesdropping sometimes if you're riding on the bus or in a public place. And everyone has stories. You have stories about your life, your friend's life, what's happening, what's not happening. Uh, and my brother, who's very interested in, in folklore and anthropology, had uh, made a comment about some of the storytellers that he had been in contact with um, from Ireland and Scotland. And he said that there, he, he told about one <coughs> older man who was the last one of his generation and what that means, because then it's all on you. And it depends on to whom have you told your stories. Lest the stories be lost, silhouettes of scars and joys, lest only one remain conscious of the weight of things long gone. Talisman against the chill of solitary mornings. Fragility is forbidden. Now there is really no return. This image here was, uh, again, 40 by 60. It's one of the few images where I did what I really started out to do, was to combine the digital with traditional printmaking. So this is the etching in a digital piece. And uh, the idea was to do these nice little intricate little uh, etchings, which very tiny for me because I like texture, and to make it bigger and go back and work on it some more. But some, somewhere along the line, uh, if it looks like a duck, let it be a duck. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I really enjoyed the digital, so why fight it? Just go ahead and do the digital. The only thing I miss is getting your hands dirty. You know, uh, people ask me, do you do anything traditional now? I said, yes, I paint women. I, because all the models that come over to the house, they get new, and I literally take the paint and I paint them. So I'm still having fun. <laughs> <laughs> It's still getting my hands a little bit dirty. <laughs> Abandoned spaces. Um, I like the title because uh, I like grunge. I like shooting old places where it looked like something used to go on here and just a little bit of life left. Uh, if you're ever in Philadelphia, what is that, Eastern State Prison? Penitentiary. Eastern State Penitentiary. Go there. I mean, it's it's... It's, it's, I can't, can't tell you. When you stand on the outside, you say, what the hell is that? I don't want to go in there. But it's a prison. It's big, dark, and big as a whole block. And uh, each cell is about six by nine. Six by nine. There's only one light. And it's the, they call it the guard's eye. It's a skylight. And it's, it's, it's hard to come out of there with a bad photograph because you got one light source. And inside the place, they, they use it all the way up to... Uh, 1970s, and it's got dilapidated, and trees start growing inside the uh, cells and everything. So it's, it's perfect for me. So I shot it with the with the attitude I'm gonna put something in there digitally, because I, I like old raggedy buildings. Uh, and I know whenever I shoot, I shoot textures because I know I'm gonna put the texture on something or in something. If I shoot uh, a space, I know I'm gonna put something in the space. You know. Uh, and the something is usually these models. And uh, the models will come over to the house and say, what are we doing today, Flat? I don't know. Sometimes we're jumping today. So I ask them, how are your knees? What are you talking about, how my knees? <laughs> so you know, they're going to be doing a lot of jumping up and down today. And then eventually I'll find a place for that, for that, uh, for them to be. Uh, you want to talk about this? This uh, particular image that is there is, was taken at uh, Father Divine's Hotel, the Divine Lorraine which was probably one of the first integrated hotels within Philadelphia in the late 40s. It was being, uh, it, it, uh, it went downhill 
and uh, ended up being not quite demolished, but it was supposed to be developed. But then the, that particular developer ran out of money and a friend of ours got the salvage contract. So this is a 14-story building. It had one-inch marble steps on the men's wing and the women's wing, but all the way up to the 14th floor. And all of the rooms, you know, which you could see, uh, had old windows in it. Sometimes the beds and what have you had been, been left in it. So it was very stirring, you know, and you really felt felt it present. We decided not to do the basement. No, we're not going out of <laughs> basement, the basement. Ba was, basement was, uh, was too scary. Um, let me see, let me try to find this one. Who comes quietly there? There where some have stood or even waited these long years. Where light must will itself to enter. Vain dreams and structures imbued with tainted visions that have not left, nor will they ever. They curl into fine shreds, tinged with regret and the lost knowledge of who you are. This one before Michael changes it, um, when you see the, the actual book, we decided we printed it out, duplicate images, and then did some hand embellishments on it. So that, to me, really gave an, an extra oomph to the, uh, both to the images and, and to the words. Again, the same, from the same structure, the old abandoned hotel. I don't know, I sometimes, I get my inspiration if I go for a walk, and it could be a word, it could be a phrase, it could be something I see and just, the rhythm of my steps has it repeating in my head, and then I, if it feels like a really good one, I try to write it down, remember it, and then write it down when I go home. And this first line of this one was one of those such occasions. She was dressed in the many years of her existence and wore rainbows round her head. She was adorned in memories, spattered with mud. You could not read all of where she'd been, and tatters of her loves clung to her restlessly. That particular image, I think, was uh, inspired by a woman, home, I think that's probably a homeless woman, a woman on the way to her shelter or between different points in her life that come down on her luck that I passed one morning as I was going to school. And she had this air, a very proud air still about her, but she had her bags and her, her layers of things that had seen better days. Uh, trans positions. This was, um, we had an opportunity to apply for a public <laughs> arts grant. We didn't get it. Uh, but it was about, everyone knows about how <coughs> Foggy Bottom, Georgetown used to be black, but they don't know the whole story. So we investigated the part about George, uh, George Washington University. And uh, all that over there used to be hardcore poor folks, uh, Germans and, Irish. and Irish and black folks. <laughs> They're real poor. And uh, we looked for some areas, we looked for some signs, but there was this, this uh, snow court and um, Hughes Mews. We finally found them. And there are little houses there. They're about houses about literally this tall and about that wide, mm -hmm. with no, no bathroom, no <coughs> nothing in them. But you, they're all fixed up and gentrified right now. Um, but if, in, in D.C., you walk in these alleys, you can find little places like that, you know, that used to have a history. And so, this about the same time when, um, not about the same, the ideas of gentrification was, was on my head. Uh, and and it's, it's still on my head now, you know, because uh, I kind of think, why does gentrification mean white? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just, and then when that happens, we're fixing up. But all the flavor in the neighborhood, the reason why you, why you live there, it's gone. You know, no more um, after hour joints, after all the clubs closed down. No more, uh, no more corner stores. You know, 
and the, the liquor store was, they sold candy, they sold everything. They canceled everybody's checks. Uh, the hardware store fixed everybody's locks in the big apartment. Uh, all that stuff goes away when we gentrify, you know. Uh, but that's not the end of the story, because uh, if you live long enough, we like to, I like to say I live through time not stuck in time. And so this was about um, that area at George Washington University, because uh, uh, we applied for the grant at the new library. Uh, we didn't get the grant, but just to make our presentation good, I decided to make this book in one day. <laughs> and so I stood up all night and, and it got done. You know, it's, it's, it, was, it was done, and I said, well, this is not bad. You know? <laughs> not a bad book. Yeah. Again, that book I think is on the table, so you can take a closer look at it. And this particular page that it's turned to um, with the figure. So, and in the very substance of bones broken, often unattended, of gnarled hands and discerning whiplashes on hunched backs. Is that image sort of a, a public health thing that wasn't? able to happen or certainly wasn't happening back in sort of 19th century and then coming into the 20th. Um, and this one figure that somehow Michael did that really seemed to combine that, that lack, um, not only of, of service, but just of, of general, where do you fit, you know, and what do you deserve to have? And the opposite page, uh, again, references an article that I had read about Georgetown shortly after I came to D.C., I think in 91, so it was probably mid-90s, in which they were talking about people in Georgetown who were in their gardening projects and their landscaping were turning up unexpectedly for them because they didn't know the history, but were turning up bones, uh, human remains, and that was dated back to that time when Georgetown was you know, an African-American community. Burials uncovered, shifting revelations of excavations in now fine landscaped gardens of genteel homes. Specifics of daily life, resistance, survival, referencing and remembering the implications of displacement and replacement we mourn and celebrate wood, stone, mortar, brick, steel, and glass, visions and revisions, conjurings at our fingertips. This is one public, I think it's the, the first one I ever got. Uh, we were approached by uh, a, what's it called? You know? I think the American Association of Museums that had their annual meeting in uh, D.C. and the local committee suggested to them that they might want to consider working with some artists and having some actual art as part of it. So the site selected was the old soldier's home, um, also the site of President Lincoln's cottage in which he uh, supposedly and probably did hopefully write the draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. So it had those were two historical sort of points. The one thing that we were trying to do as we had done with the Georgetown project that we felt was important was to honor, bring to the fore the African American participation in the Civil War. Um, down on U Street, there's the Civil African American Museum. There's also the African American Civil War Monument that has a lot of names. And so all of those figured into our uh, creation of this particular project, which, was, which were two banners, uh, 40 feet long by 48 inches high. And the challenge with this particular project was that they had many committees in charge of the old soldier's home. There's a committee for trees, a committee for bushes, a committee for the buildings themselves, uh, if the building was a certain date, that was a different committee. So <laughs> everything was very well tended to and minded. And uh, th there were two artist groups, who were, uh, another husband and wife team also, who collaborated. But everything had to pass approval of all the committees before it could go up. 
So to use nails or not to use nails? How do you hang something on this? And we, we figured everything out, fortunately, and also with the help of some friends of ours who were stagehands, who, who really knew certain tricks of the trade to, <coughs> you know, to getting it up. Martha Jackson Jarvis. Yeah, Martha Jackson Jarvis, yeah, and, uh, and her daughter, and uh, another friend, Remy, and some friends of his came. So we all managed to get it up, and then the next, th that evening, huge rain fell, and with winds. And so, you know, you wake up in the morning and say, shall I call, or shall we wait to, for them to call us? And they called us, <coughs> and they said, well, you might want to come up and, and look at it, because uh, something's happened, you know, to your banner, so we didn't know whether something happened meant it was down, it, you know, it was gone, or up in the trees or what, but it was just minor damage, which we were able to fix up. But the wonderful thing about it, visually, was just the uh, company out in San Francisco who did the work. They, they do banners for places like airports, and uh, so they know their product very well, the fabric on which these things are. And so I said, well, this material was used in a banner at Miami Airport. So we said, okay, we'll go with that. But the translucency of it was something that we hadn't really figured on. So the day that they had the opening reception, there was a wonderful sunset, which in some of the photographs you can you know, see through. But I did, um, I think, four poems to go with that piece. Oh, wait a minute. That's, that's what's now the title. Got oh, that okay. Back. This is a, just a brief statement because as we're going back again, a project that went from one form to, uh, to the book, uh, or to a book, I thought that the first pages of it were a little empty, so I added this, this particular phrase. Turmoil and suffering, seeking freedom, respite sometimes beneath a tree. And the image on the front <clears throat> is actually the oldest tree on the site that was probably there when Lincoln was doing the Emancipation Proclamation. So we took a picture of that and then Michael incorporated that in the image. The image of the young man known as a John Doe that I think that someone has recently done some research and they did manage to identify him. I don't know how. One of the many people who have worked with the collection here at the library. Uh, Lillian Quick, I think it's yes. the Civil War collection. <coughs> One of the things that I found out uh, in terms of the, the participation of African Americans in the war were not only the, the militia, the military people, but also the support personnel, of course, like nurses who probably did the same job as the doctors would have been doing nowadays, uh, and other things. This was one Susan Taylor, whom there's a, an image in the collection, and this was what, thinking about her and what her life must have been like, or might have been like, or could have been like then. Dawn, the stillness time, when night terrors move on, and healing balms and words soothe pain and quiet fears. The coolness of dew and fever root, the sense of dreaming, peace bought in the early hours, banishing the stink of rot and the rigors of death, compassion and life victorious in those early morning moments of the quietude of day. Who was Miss Taylor? She was the nurse, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, let's talk about the bottom, Michael. Well, I, I had a concept of, uh, you know, war goes on, more people die. When we started the banner, there was a few names at the bottom and just piled up and it just piled up and it just piled up. But the other thing I thought about was, like I'm 70, 71, and uh, so I went to school in the 50s and 60s, very undergraduate, and you know, the movies and black and white TV. And, but in school, the only thing we knew about black folks was George Washington College, mm -hmm. the peanut man. And that was one paragraph. Mm -hmm. And he got the history book about this big. Mm -hmm. But all this information was out there. It was then not important. I don't know what you mean, not important. I, well, it happened. You know, uh, the idea that somebody thinks 
everything connected to you and your life and people like you, it just ain't important. You know, it's just, yeah. You know, because then you, you look at uh, probably the history of the Caribbean and probably the history of Australia. Is that it's just not important. You know, so a lot of times you kind of make things important by making them big. I used to do this, before I got into digital work, I did a drawings and paintings about uh, black on black crime. And my, uh, my uh, artists came, they were about this big. You know, and they did that small because it just wasn't important. I, I would do a four feet by six feet, uh, a piece on it. Uh, but how, how can all this information be out there? And you can't say you didn't know about it. It just wasn't important, you know. I think one of the things, and you know, we're here in the Library of Congress, and we think about libraries, and I was also thinking about the uh, people who commission the piece, uh, the Museum Association, but these are all repositories, and so in the you know that in the warehouse somewhere in some part of these institutions and these buildings there are there is the information you know the data the data is there which is why you know research is so important and people who are doing it who, who come with different perspectives and uh, different ways of thinking about connecting the dots which are signs in places like libraries uh, and having access to the back rooms of museums, you know, which is so important to, to be able to work with. This was the last poem of that, of that series, the last piece. The, the figures in the background are um, people who fled from the South who had come to the D.C. <coughs> area, most of them. Um, because they had more options, more possibilities, both to get away from uh, enslavement, but also for either moving north or participating in some form in the, in the war. And many of the people who were represented in the photograph collections, um, I think, are uh, called um, conscripts. So there were people who would have been free during a particular military operation. Telling the children you will dance memories of feet waiting in river waters, riding with all those cast into the sea on swells of moonlight, following those who leapt and waded rivers. Under branches of light and presence, you declare, I am. We are in the midnight hours and at high noon, all those who died journeying the deep waters and the dusty roads protecting shadows and claiming rhythms of remembering in other places. <coughs> and these two um, poems, this is again a very well-known image and everybody who's been to the new museum over on 14th Street uh, will recognize it because it's one of the, the key ones there and then the, the John Doe, because that was how this, in, this young man was identified. And the flag that one has uh, always hoped for, off to the right. Uh, these two pieces I wrote together as a, kind of as a, as a pair. The one on the left with the image of John Doe, thinking about the site for the uh, exhibit. And the one on the left, a more open statement. Place of solitude and solace, place of sorrow and pain, of reflection and introspection. Now they cannot hear the wind, although the trees remain. Then they would have heard the leaf songs, heard the work songs and the sorrow songs, heard and known the stories. We have those carried on the winds of memory, those set down note by deliberate note, word by weighted word. We are the keepers of artifacts, their voices, their visions, the culture of given peoples, their spaces and times, the truth of being and creating, of the imagination 
and the laying on of hands. We stand together, we do, on the edge of beginning, you with your strength of hard wood, red oak, ash, and southern pine, I with the power of waters and the wisdom of my promise reflected in midnight skies. <coughs> For the planting of seed seasons we have come, for the raising up seasons, and the falling of the leaves seasons, and the gathering up and the laying down of dry limbs. Under passion's roof, in fields and grasses fed with blood, under wide skies and trees grown old and wise, seen so much, seen too much, we stand in hope and dream and do. We stand together in places of solitude, sorrow, and pain, and at the edges of beginning in the solace of reflection. We draw near in places of solace, sharing grief and desolation, sharing faith. We know the tumult of the edges of beginning and the silences of endings. Endings. Oh, nope. yes. And that's okay. the end. <laughs> Hope y'all enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? Jerry. I think as we were as we were working on it, uh, particularly the first book, we each had something that we that we loved. You know, I had a phrase that I thought was just really powerful, and Michael had an image that he was, you know, felt the same way about. And sometimes he'd say, "Do you have any words that go with this?" You know, and I would come and I would look and I would either come back with something or I said, "Let me think about it and then come back with something later." And sometimes I didn't have any for that particular image. And the same thing for him. I see, I still have a couple of things that I've got, you know, that I'd like Michael to do some images for. Uh, like my, my bus poem, for example, is one. But um, it's, it's just, it was just that it has been so far just basically that simple. And it either, it worked, it was okay. Um, and then, a couple of a couple of, of poems. Um, I wrote one poem. I was looking for something else on the computer, and I pulled up this image that Michael had been working on, and I hadn't seen it before because we don't always. I don't always show Michael things that I write immediately. Sometimes it's a really long time, like years, uh, and he has images that he's constantly working on and constantly changing. So I don't always know which version it is that I'm going to be trying to respond to, and so. Um, awesome. I, I looked at it and this, this poem just came out. And then afterwards he told me that it was a poem written about a, a, a it had been an asylum for African Americans who were considered mentally ill in Patapsco. <coughs> uh, it's called, you know, the day we were set free. And I had no idea of knowing that, but that's what it looked like and it felt to me. So. I don't know too many poets, but uh, I, I got to, I was introduced to poets, uh, Charles Blackwell and <coughs> Kenny Carroll and uh, the wild man, Gaston Neal. Uh, and uh, he was the one that really got Carroll out of the closet. You know. <laughs> come on out of here. And, uh, don't do that nice stuff. Man. Come on, give me, give me some edge. You know, that was, that was Gaston. <laughs> but all the poets I know, they had this big raggedy book. The pages falling all out of it. You know, they, 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 they Carol go upstairs. This is before we got heavy into the computer. She'd go upstairs and come back with this book. And uh, I got something in here. Oh, it's in, in here somewhere. You know, like this. But the deal is, you always got to you always got to work. You, you, you can't wait. You, you, you got to work. Uh, I decided that quite a few years ago. Uh, you got 20 minutes a day. You do one thing 20 minutes a day, you're going to get good at it. 
You know, even exercise is very hard. So you, we, we always have something to work from, not to work for. Will any of the things in the basement, which I'm going to take a closer look at now, um, ever get resurrected or reconfigured? Yeah, because, uh, you know, the other thing about, uh, not necessarily true with drawing and, and painting, but with printmaking and digital print, you got prints that don't work. And you don't want to throw them away. Because you know damn well you're going to cut that sucker up and make a collage. <laughs> but you never quite seem to get to that. Because you're still thinking about the new image. You know? But sometimes when you work on an old image, you, you, your brain goes back to that old time again. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to get past that. Uh, what's the fellow in New Orleans? John Scott? No. Uh, he was the only dude I've seen that took a bunch of old prints that didn't work, cut them up, and do collages out of them. And it worked. All printmakers think about doing that. You know, that's why they don't throw away nothing. <laughs> EJ, she don't throw away anything. <laughs> you know, because it's going to happen one day. You know, we, we, we gonna, it's, it's going to happen. Well, we're going we're gonna to deal with those old things. I don't know how we're going to deal with it. You know, uh, maybe the, the, the canvas we're going to work on be the size of that wall. You know, and uh, play Romeo Beard and just cut that sucker out and <laughs> put it up there and see what happens. You know? Yes, Mr. Green. <laughs> That's what we're good for. <laughs> Portfolios, again, not all the portfolios had words on them. Words on. This portfolio here was a direct response to the, uh, a trip to Ghana when I saw the castle, slave castle, I call it. And uh, I shot one for two hours. And, but I, to me, they were just set, stage sets and textures. And, uh, and uh, I just knew I'm going to jump on this as soon as I get back home. Um, the portfolios was out of that printmaking thing of small pieces for people with little money. I always had this thing with uh, making my work accessible. Um, so I would do a portfolio of small eight by eight by ten for a lot of the shows, and I put them put them together, and uh, that's how. Yeah, you know, th th that I never quite got it together about how to make money in art. You know, that's why I taught school. Uh, that's why most people I know who are artists, they teach school. But some of us are fortunate enough to even <laughs> make a living out of it. It's because we, we were at our age, we weren't taught. It was just through osmosis. You get out there and you uh, go into that gallery over there, and they tell you no. Then you go to the next gallery, they tell you no. You do that for about two years, maybe somebody might say yes. They see you come in the door with that big portfolio. They know, student, come back, come back later, two years. <laughs> you know, and you, you don't get discouraged, you just keep going. But today, they, they're a little bit more on the game of how to make a living out of this. And thanks to um, computer, YouTube, I call it YouTube View. You can learn everything on YouTube View right now. You, you can, I mean, just so much information out here right now that wasn't out there. You know. You had a question? A lot of times, my work is based on uh, where, I, where I'm going to, where I travel to. Uh, and usually, uh, through these African what's it, conferences, uh, literature association. African Literature Association, uh, it had something to do with black folks. And I, was, I always asked her, take me, take me, take me. You know, I, I just found that, something that, to do wait, <laughs> now that happened because those of you who may be printmakers, there's a Southern Graphic printmaking conference, which is wonderful, that Michael used to go to, we would see Zubair and 
you know, other folks. And there would be this product fair, and Michael would come back, and there's always, he would always have an essay for this time. So I said, I need to go to one of those. So I went to one of those, and then we began, you know, exchanging. So that, that worked out well. Susan. That's very, very good. I like that. <laughs> we, you know, Michael has a show that's upcoming uh, at the Cat Center with Sylvia Catalog, and we had talked a number of years, a couple, maybe two or three years ago, about doing a book about Michael, and we're doing it. So we've got, um, but about the two of us, I guess, you know, I used to never tell anybody that I was a poet, and I did not tell anybody that I wrote poetry. I had a, the, the people I learned Portuguese from had very good poet friends, they're both academics and they work in particular literature. Uh, and they told one of their friends who was a poet in Brazil about their friend, me, who wrote poetry. So I would send some things down because sometimes I would get very daring and I'd try to write poetry. Or why would you write it in, po in Spanish or Portuguese? And so, but I would always, always call them poemoids, you know, right? I couldn't bring myself to, you know, take ownership of, but again, Michael and our friend Gaston Neal were the two people who, you know, put the rope around my wrist or whatever part of me and then dragged me uh, to read, you know, before more than one person. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and I'm very grateful for that, you know, and all the friends who have listened to me, you know, over, you know, over the years and telling Christina, Wasserman was one, and he at the Fay, and sometimes at the gallery that represented Michael, or he would present some of the pieces. So I do the portfolio pieces were like four by six, and so he exhibited all of those in the gallery, and I read the poems that went with them. And after a while, you begin to think, yes, this is something that I do. I'm not, you know, that's me. But in terms of, of, of ongoing like documentation and both, yeah, like what you did with EJ, it, well, for example, I mean in and terms other of, people. You know, setting the model for African American young artists, because, you know, you're always looking at other people's stories, and it would be a great read. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know. That's something to think about. Yeah. What about they are open to it. They need someone to do it for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, yeah, and my, my friend and, and uh, former student. My son by another mother, um, from whom I've known for a long time, one of my students way back when I was teaching at Bryn Mawr, um, has been after me to do something like that. In fact, we have kind of a joint project 